Well, you know, as a father, what I want more than anything for my kids is for them to become everything that God created them to be. To not only, uh, of course, recognize who they are in Christ, but to fully realize who they are in Christ. And so as their father, of course, that means I offer them guidance and instruction. I teach them skills and give them resources. Every good thing that I can give them, of course, I give them to help them become everything that God created them to be. But listen, at the end of the day, they have to do something with all of that. Right? It's my responsibility as a father to equip my kids for this life, but it's their responsibility to make the most of what I've given them. Because if all they do is receive that guidance and instruction and teaching and those skills and resources, if all they do is take all of that in but never act on any of that, then they will always be limited to some degree when it comes to reaching their fullest potential in this life. And listen, it's the same for all of us and our Heavenly Father. You understand, he's given us his holy word, his holy church, and his holy spirit. Why? To guide us and teach us, to equip us, and to empower us so that we can become all that he's created us to become. But at the end of the day, we are responsible for what we do or don't do with all of that. James, the brother of Jesus, said, whatever you have that is good in your life, you have because of God. That's actually the Rucci Standard Version. James said it this way. He said, Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. James 1.17. Okay, everything good in your life came from God. And so the obvious question is, what do you plan to do with that? What do you plan to do? with the guidance and instruction and skills and resources that he's blessed you with. Because if all that you do is receive those good gifts and then you keep it all to yourself, you don't use what he's given you for the purpose it was actually intended for, then you'll never fully realize the potential that he wove into your spiritual DNA before he even spoke this world into existence. The Apostle Paul put it this way, he said, We're his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them, Ephesians 2.10. And when Paul says uh, that we should walk in them, by the way, that word walk, I think it's one of the Apostle Paul's favorite words. In the ancient Greek, it was the word peripateo, which is a reference to how a, a person conducts their entire life, how you live, how you occupy your time. And so that phrase actually was a, uh, a Hebrew idiom, an ancient Hebrew saying that pictured a person's life as a road that one would travel along. And so Paul was saying, look, you were created to do the work of Christ. Your entire life and everything you've been given is supposed to be exhausted in the service of Jesus Christ. In the same letter, he went on to say, speaking the truth in love, we're to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ, from whom the whole body, it's all of us, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped, when each part is working properly makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love, Ephesians 4, 15 and 16. In other words, God gives us his word. He gives us his truth in love. Why? To equip us for growth. But listen, it is only when each part is working properly. It's only when we act on his word that we actually grow and become all that he created us to be. So look, uh, if you ever wonder what you might be able to accomplish in the future with whatever God is going to give you, just look at what you're accomplishing now with what he's already given you. It's a dead giveaway. If you are accomplishing much for Christ now with whatever he's given you to work with, then you will accomplish even more in the future as he continues to add more and more and more of those good things in your life. But listen, this is just as true. If you do very little for God with what you have now, you will do very little for God when you have more later. It's a fact. And if you're thinking, well, yeah, but I don't want to do something he's called me to do until I know I will succeed. Listen, God didn't call you to be successful. He called you to be obedient. Whether or not you're successful is up to him. Whether or not you're obedient, well, well that is entirely up to you. When we started this church, we had 12 people and no income. 
Five of those people being me and my wife and our three kids. We didn't have everything we needed to start a church, not by a long shot, but we started it anyway because that's what God called us to do. And as we've been obedient, he's given us more and more and more to work with. And look, I hope that never changes, but the truth is, when we started the church, we only had to get 12 people on board with God's plan. Actually, it was only nine people because my three kids didn't have a choice. Today, we have a few hundred people. And just so that you understand, throughout the past six years of pastoring this church at points all along the way, I've had to stop and ask myself the question, what are you going to do with what you've been given? But today, I'm not just asking myself that question. Today, I'm asking you, what are you going to do with what you've been given? As it turns out, Jesus had a lot to say. On the subject, so let's open our Bibles as we continue our sermon series, working our way through the gospel according to Mark to chapter 4 of that book and see if we can answer that question. We'll pick up the story where we left off last week at verse 21 and read through verse 25. And he said to them, Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? For nothing is hidden except to be made manifest, nor is anything secret except to come to light. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. And he said to them, Pay attention to what you hear. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. So Jesus continues to teach these massive crowds of people from a boat just off the shore of the Sea of Galilee, as we saw last week earlier in the chapter, to literally keep from getting crushed by the people who were pressing in, trying to get close to him. And he begins this next parable by asking a question. Is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? Now listen. There is one significant flaw in many of the English translations of this verse, including the translation we're using here today. It says, is a lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? The word a being an indefinite article for those of you grammar fans out there. The problem being, when you read that question in the ancient Greek, in the original language that Mark wrote in, and clearly he uses a definite article before the word lamp. So the correct way to read this question by Jesus is actually, is the lamp, not is a lamp, is the lamp brought in to be put under a basket or under a bed and not on a stand? The reason that's important is because Jesus isn't simply referring to just any lamp or just a lamp. No, he's referring to the lamp. He's referring to himself and the message that he's brought with him, which lines up with the rest of Scripture, where the lamp is often used as a metaphor for God or the Messiah and his gospel. We see it in 2 Samuel 22, 29, 2 Kings 8, 19, Psalm 132, 17, Psalm 119, 105, John 1, 4 and 5, John 8, 12, just to name a few. And so Jesus says, listen up. Because this isn't just any message. This is the message. And I didn't bring it into this world to hide it. So pay attention to what you hear. Listen to what I'm telling you. Because with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. And still more will be added to you. For to the one who has, more will be given. And from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. That was actually an ancient Jewish proverb that shows up in various forms of literature from that time period. In fact, I was reading some different versions of it this week in some ancient literature. One of the versions I read said it this way, in the pot in which you cook for others, you'll be cooked. The literal translation from the Greek, as Mark wrote, it says, in whatever measure you measure, it will be measured to you and it will be added to you. I also read at least two other versions in the Talmud. That's the the central text of rabbinic Judaism. Here's the point. Jesus was using a very familiar saying that they all would have understood. And yet, instead of applying it to some common aspect of Hebrew culture, he was applying it to the gospel. You see, Jesus was saying, you cannot hide what you've been given. In fact, if you conceal it long enough, what you've been given will be taken from you. Why? Because you cannot be trusted with it. And yet if you reveal it to the world, 
If you let this light of truth that you've been given shine through your life for everyone to see, even more will be given to you because you've proven yourself faithful with what you've been given. It's basically another version of the parable of the talents, if you're familiar with that story in Matthew 25, which ends with Jesus saying, for to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has will be taken away. Matthew 25, 29. You see, the church, the local church is the harbinger of truth for this world. We have been entrusted with the gospel, the most profoundly life-transforming message in all of human history. Now, why do you think we have been given this truth? Just so that we can be saved in here? Because if that was the case, then Jesus' great commission to his disciples would have been, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and be saved. But that's not what he said. He said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you. We are the church, which means we cannot hide what we've been given, and yet I've had so many people who profess to be Christians over the years say to me when I talk to them about Jesus, they'll say, well, that's fine, Pastor, but the truth is my faith is a private matter. No, it isn't. There is nothing private about your faith in Jesus Christ. Nothing. Listen, Jesus didn't allow himself to be mocked, beaten, tortured, nailed to a Roman cross and brutally murdered so that we could have a private faith. I'm sorry if the gospel makes you uncomfortable. Too bad. If people can march down the streets of our cities boldly celebrating every kind of sin imaginable, surely we can boldly proclaim the righteousness of Christ to our neighbor. We cannot hide what we've been given. Otherwise, Jesus said it will be taken away. And so look, if you can't let your light shine in this highly religious Christian culture that we're living in, at least compared to other parts of the world, then what do you think is going to happen to your private faith the moment any real pressure is applied to Christians in this country? I'll tell you what's going to happen. Your private faith won't last two seconds. Because if you can't let the truth of the gospel shine through you when it's easy, you will never let the gospel shine through you when it's hard. This goes for every one of us. R.C. Sproul said... We're allowing God to be eclipsed by vignettes of pop psychology from the pulpit or by ministers communicating their private opinions on social and political issues of the day. It is the duty of the church in every generation, of every pastor and of every Christian to take up that lamp, cast the basket aside, and put the light in a prominent place where people can behold the truth of God and of His Son. This is a big part of why we believe God called us to plant this church to begin with. To preach the whole counsel of God. That's why we preach and teach the way we do. That's why we go through entire books of the Bible the way we do. Because the gospel must be preached with compassion, saturated in love, yet in its entirety. Even when it makes us uncomfortable. So that's one of the core commitments of this church to the region that God has planted us in, to make disciples, teaching them to observe all that he commanded us, never hiding what we've been given. Let's keep reading, verses 26 through 29. And he said, the kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground. He sleeps and rises night and day, and the seed sprouts and grows. He knows not how. The earth produces by itself first the blade, then the ear, then the full grain in the ear. But when the grain is ripe, at once he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. So as Jesus continues to teach, he goes back to the idea of sowing seeds. The same theme he talked about in the first half of the chapter, except now instead of focusing on the soil, he focuses on the seed itself. And of course, 
Each one of us is called to sow the seed, which we learned last week is the gospel, which means our responsibility is to broadcast the seed, to spread the gospel. But notice what Jesus says about the seed after it's sown. He says the sower has nothing to do with whether or not the seed actually takes root in the soil. In other words, we're responsible for spreading the gospel, not seeing to it that people accept it. Because we cannot make people accept it. And so whether or not the seed takes root in the soil, whether or not the gospel actually takes root in the human heart is actually beyond our control. Our part is simply to sow the seed and then to patiently wait in faith that God will bring from it a harvest. Remember, you're not called to be successful. You're called to be obedient. God is responsible for the success You are responsible for the obedience, which means you just keep sowing seed, regardless of the outcome. You just keep sowing seed, even if it doesn't take root in the hearts of those you share the gospel with. You just keep sowing seed. Why? Because being obedient means you cannot keep what you've been given. The Apostle Paul said, whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will reap the flesh from the flesh will reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap if we do not give up. Galatians 6, 7 through 9. If we do not give up. If we do not give up. If we do not give up what? Sowing seed making disciples, doing good. So there's going to be a harvest from the seed that we sow, and yet we cannot determine the harvest. That part comes in due season, according to Paul, and that due season is determined by God alone when he decides the church has completed the task that he's assigned to us, which, of course, is to sow the seed. So even though uh, the first century zealots, is a Jewish faction who aspired to Uh, follow the footsteps of the Maccabean freedom fighters who liberated Palestine from the Seleucid dynasty of the second century B.C. They thought they were going to do the same thing. And so even though those first century zealots believed they could usher in the kingdom of God by staging a revolution against the Roman Empire, and even though the apocalyptic movement of the day said that the coming of the kingdom could be predicted by careful observation, and even though the Pharisees believed they could hasten the coming of the kingdom through strict legal observance in the end, not one of those people could determine the end-time harvest of souls for the sake of the kingdom of God, and neither can we. And yet, our part in bringing about the harvest couldn't be more vital because there cannot be a harvest without seed first being sown. So just to be sure, you get this. From before the foundation of the world, before God created any of this, He created a plan for you and for me and for everyone else. A plan for our eternity. And the the culmination of that plan is the return of Jesus Christ to harvest the souls of every human being who would ever receive the seed of his gospel that has been spread by the church. So you understand. That is why you exist. That's why you're here. To sow the seed. To spread the gospel. That's it. You're not here to make a name for yourself. You're not here to build your own kingdom. You're not here to leave your mark on this world. You are not here to get the most out of this life that you can. No, you were put here on this earth for one reason, to sow seed. That's it. And so in order to help you do that, God has given you all of these resources, time and talent and money and material possessions and wisdom and understanding and relationships and ambition. He's given you all of these resources, not for you to build your kingdom, but for you to build his kingdom by spreading the gospel. I just want to make sure we get this today because every single thing that is good that you have, you have for one purpose, to help you sow more seed. That's it. And yet there are untold numbers of Christians, 
attending churches every week who have gifts and talents and resources and ambition that they've been given by God. Gifts meant to do good, meant to advance the kingdom of God, meant to make disciples, and yet instead of using all that they've been given to sow the seed of the gospel, they keep it all to themselves. It's like an apple tree, not allowing anyone else to consume its apples because it wants to keep all that beautiful fruit to itself. Right? The apples might make the tree look beautiful and feel good about itself, but if the tree thinks that is the sole purpose of the apples, well, then it has completely missed the point of why it has the privilege of producing apples to begin with. Right? Because if you leave all of those beautiful apples on the apple tree, what happens? They rot. And then they don't have the benefit of the fruit, and the tree doesn't have the benefit of the fruit. It's wasted fruit. No one benefits from it because the apples are not produced for the consumption of the apple tree. The apples are produced for the consumption of others who are starving and need its fruit to be fed and to grow and to become healthy. That is the only reason the apple tree produces apples. To feed others. You understand that's the reason you've been given good gifts. To give them away. To feed other people the gospel. To make disciples. And I'll just tell you that I believe with all my heart. That is a big part of why God has allowed this church to continue to grow the way it has. Because of the seed that we've sown. It's been six solid years of pouring our lives into others. And and what a privilege to be able to give away what we've been given. And I've watched so many of you doing that every day. What a privilege it is to sow seed into good soil and then stand back and watch God make it grow. But please hear me. The moment we stop sowing seed is the moment this church begins to die. We cannot keep what we've been given. Otherwise, all the beautiful fruit that we produce begins to rot so we give it away it's the way it has to be we give it away if we want to keep growing and keep producing we give it away we give away everything that he's given us and then we watch him make it grow let's finish our story for today verses 30 through 34 and he said with what can we compare the kingdom of God or what parable shall we use for it It is like a grain of mustard seed, which when sown on the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when it is sown, it grows up and becomes larger than all the garden plants and puts out large branches so that the birds of the air can make nests in its shade. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He did not speak to them without a parable, but privately to his own disciples. He explained everything. The parable of the mustard seed is one of those teachings that was heavily foundational for the early church, much like the parable of the sower and the soils that we looked at last week earlier in the chapter, which again we see evidenced here by the fact that it appears in all three of the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, also in the Coptic gospel of Thomas, which of course is not a part of the Bible, but still contains about 114 sayings of Jesus, many of those confirmed in the other biblical gospels, including this parable. And so this was clearly a profoundly important parable, foundationally important, in fact, to the early church for a couple of reasons. First of all, when Jesus describes the mustard seed becoming a large tree or a shrub big enough for birds to nest in, he's actually alluding to the fact that the kingdom of God will include Gentiles as well as Jews, which, of course, was not uh, only extremely controversial at the time, but it was foundational for the first century church. And yet that is what he foreordained long before there even was a church. Numerous times in the Old Testament, the prophets used the image of birds nesting in the branches of trees to allude to Gentiles being included in the kingdom of God. Ezekiel uh, seventeen twenty three is one example. Daniel 4, 9 through 21 being another. So Jesus was saying you, you cannot limit the church to the group of people you most identify with only. And then secondly, when he contrasts the amazingly small mustard seed with the fantastically large tree that it becomes, Jesus was saying you cannot limit the growth of the church because of its small beginnings. 
In other words, Jesus says you cannot limit what you've been given, either in scope or in size, despite your preconceived notions of who you think it should include or how big or how small you would like for it to be. And listen, when we started this church with just a handful of people, I never in my wildest dreams thought we'd plant a campus at an addiction recovery facility. Never crossed my mind. I didn't know we'd have an abortion recovery ministry. I didn't know most of the missionaries we'd send out would be going into the heart of Islam, some of the spiritually darkest nations on the earth. I didn't know we'd have so many different kinds of people from so many different kinds of backgrounds coming to this church to worship and be discipled together in a spirit of such tremendous unity. But we decided from the beginning that we weren't going to limit who this church would minister to. And I'll tell you, when we started at number two Church Street in that small little building where our kids are today, little did we know that two years in, we'd need to add a second service. When we announced that we were adding that second service in that little building, there were some folks who weren't very happy about that because it would split up the congregation. And yet we had committed to never limit the growth of this church either. So we added a second service at two years, and those of you who were there faithfully pressed on with us. Little did we know that one year later, we'd outgrow two services and have an opportunity to buy this building and the one next to it. And so we did. And there were some folks who were not very happy about that because they loved our little location in that church building across the street. But because we'd committed to never limiting the scope or growth of this church, we moved and brought everyone back into one service together. And those of you who were there faithfully pressed on with us. Little did we know that six months after moving into this building, we'd outgrow one service and need to add a second. And there were some folks at the time who weren't so happy about that because we'd be splitting up the congregation. But we did it anyway because we'd made a commitment to God never to limit the scope or growth of his church. And so we added that second service and those of you who were there faithfully pressed on with us. It brings us to today. We're now exceeding the limitations of all three of these buildings put together. And yet there's so much more that God has called us to. There are more people to be reached and more kinds of people to be reached. And yet we're rapidly running out of room. There are ministries that need to be expanded and many ministries that need to be created. And yet our facilities will not allow for all of that growth. There are opportunities to invite our community, our city in to host events that would allow us to reach people who will otherwise never darken the doors of a church. But we cannot take advantage of those opportunities presently with the limitations of our current facilities. And so today I'm simply asking you, what are you going to do with what you've been given? Because our natural tendency is to project our limitations onto God. But God is limitless. He's simply looking for willing vessels. People who are wholly submitted to His way, to His will, to His plan for you and everything that He's given you. So what are you going to do with what you've been given?